<laughs> we're all having, <laughs> we're all having trouble <laughs> Zoom problems. <laughs> okay, so I'm Hollis Buley, and I have um I coordinate the Seabird Monitoring Project. And um, I should say that we're a chapter of the Seabird Protection Network, which um, works under the auspices of the Gulf of the, uh, the Greater Farallons uh, Marine Sanctuary. And it is a statewide um, organization that does outreach and public education in an effort to try to minimize disturbances. And so they do a lot of outreach with boaters and um, pilots and uh, kayakers that uh, come into contact with bird colonies. So I'm gonna share my screen, I hope. Oops. Okay, so can everybody see my screen? Yes. Yep. Okay, so um, I don't know how many of you have participated in a citizen or community science program before. Uh, Mary Ellen Hannibal has written a wonderful book on uh, citizen science. And she says, if you want to deepen your experience of life, the first thing to do is start observing. But as long as you're out there observing, you may as well be documenting what you're observing and um, collecting that data and turning it into others. Because um, right now, um, oops. Well, got it. I'm not able to. move through my slides. <laughs> Can you try the right arrow on your keyboard? That's what I'm doing. No. And down arrow. OK, so. OK. Oop, there we go. Yeah, my keyboard doesn't work, but something else does. Okay, so um, I have the chat open here, but feel free to um, unmute yourself and throw questions at me. And I'm kind of paying attention to the chat, but um, just brood anything out if you wish. So why monitor seabird success? And um, seabirds are at the top of the food chain. So they're impacted by changes throughout the entire marine ecosystem. And for that reason, they're sentinels of what's going on with the health of the entire ecosystem. So biologists are really interested in um, their productivity for this reason, because it tells us a lot about um, the uh, rest of the uh, food chain that's going on in the water. And they are visible because they're in the air um, rather than diving down and counting fish and uh, other organisms. Um, Climate change has a profound impact on marine ecosystems, and so it's of special interest to everybody right now. And monitoring seabirds help us track these changes in the environment, which ultimately impact us. Then there are other climate impacts. Um, the little oyster catchers, which you'll see in the photo essay, are dependent upon these offshore rocks. And with sea level rise, they're going to suffer habitat loss, and we're not quite sure where they're going to go in order to do their breeding when that happens. And um, another reason is that it's just kind of fun to become familiar with family life. Um, if you're out there with your binoculars or your scope, when normally when you finally get focused on a bird, they just fly off. And when they're stuck on their nest, they can't do it. They're, you know, you can, you can watch them for hours. Um, Bonnie is a clinical, retired clinical psychologist, and she says that she likes being out there for the behavior. And so with the family life, it gives you a really nice opportunity to observe the parents with their chicks 
And then also the interactions between um, different species as well. So um, these are some of our uh, breeding seabirds um, on the, can you see my pointer? No. Okay, then uh, I won't rely on it. On um, the upper left is a Brant's cormorant, and um, they are the chunkiest of the three species of cormorants that we have off of our shores. In the middle, on the middle top, are the pelagic cormorants, and they have a slender head and a slender neck. They're the smallest, and they breed on vertical cliffs. Um, on the top right is a little common myrrh. They're kind of our, our penguins. Um, they have short little legs, they stand upright, and they're, um, they're, they're kind of amusing to watch. Uh, the lower left are um, the Frenchies that Diane was talking about. They're very, very playful. They have bright red throats, bright red feet, and um, uh, bright white patches when they're in their breeding clothing. Uh, the center here in the bottom is a double crested cormorant, and um, you can identify the double crested by kind of yellow orange gular or pouch or bill. And when they're in the air, um, they have a crooked neck. Um, the Brant's cormorant and pelagics both have necks, and it's a uh, the Brant's neck is is shorter. And then over here on the bottom right is, uh, oh, I'm in the way, is um, the black oyster catcher, which is everybody's favorite. And this is a rock that's right off of the west side, the west parking lot of Bodega Head. I'm getting a message that my internet connection's unstable. So um, let me know if you lose me. Um, these these are a group of birds that are all breeding together. These are Brant's cormorants up here on the upper left, and they're sitting on nests made of um, red algae. These are Western gulls that are on the lower right. And I don't know if you can make it out because they're pretty well camouflaged, but there are a couple of um, little fuzzy spotted chicks that blend in with the granite there. Um, and there are a couple of the common murres that are in the background here, and they have been prospecting this, this rock. They haven't been breeding here. Uh, we think they may be this year, and they have a tendency to prospect the Brant's Cormorant's breeding rocks to see what's going on. And so um, we're going to be watching them this year to see if they're breeding on this rock as well. And the beginning of the season is courtship. Um, in the upper left corner here is a a uh, double crested cormorant, and they have bright turquoise eyes, um, a bright orange gular or pouch, and their throats are this deep azure blue. They're absolutely striking, and of course they have the crest here. In the middle is a Brant's cormorant in full display, and um, his pouch or gular is this bright blue color. It fades pretty quickly, by the way, when they start laying their eggs. Um, there's a couple of oyster catchers that are breeding here on the right. On the bottom row here is a couple of western gulls. Right now we can have as many as eight or nine or ten different species of gulls that are here in the winter time going into the early spring. But um, the only year-round resident is the western gulls and they're the only ones that breed here. And then here are the little cormorants, I mean uh, the little uh, guillemots here on the lower right again. So um, the guillemots are really, really playful. Here you can see their bright red throats and their bright red feet. And uh, the next step is building the nest. And um, over here are the pelagic cormorants and they have white uh, flanks patches, which again, they start to fade pretty quickly um, once, they, once the chicks hatch. Uh, this one's on a couple of eggs here. They are, um, they look black, but they, when the sunlight is on them, they're really um, iridescent in these beautiful shades of greens and blues and purples. And they like to nest, as I said, on vertical rock faces on these little tiny shells because they feel safe from predators. And um, they have, uh, they nest with vegetation 
Um, you can see them coming in with uh, seaweed in their mouths and dropping it down. Um, down in the lower left here are Brant's cormorants, and they are nesting on vegetation. And they're sharing these pilings here with double-crested cormorants that have a stick nest. And the double-crested are the only species that will also um, nest near freshwater. So if you're walking around Spring Lake, you can see them there. They nest in trees there. Um, they also nest here on the marine environment, and they use vegetation as well as sticks. And our black oyster catchers, um, they build their nests out of rocks and pebbles, which uh, their eggs kind of blend in pretty much with the granite. It's either pebbles or shells, depending on what they have. And it looks like a haphazard arrangement, but believe it or not, they actually build practice nests while they're courting. And uh, they, they walk around and with these long orange mandibles, they're picking up pebbles and tossing them over the backs of their shoulders. And um, it's, it's not a haphazard arrangement as far as they're concerned. And here's a Brant's cormorant flying in with this huge chunk of red algae. And you can see over here, there is a pair on a nest that's built of algae. And um, they're also thieves. Um, last year or the year before, we were out off of the west side of Bodega Head and there was a nesting pair of gulls on the top of the rock. And below them was a pair of um, Brant's cormorants. And below them was another pair of Brant's cormorants. And the middle pair of cormorants were paying attention to the gulls. And they were reaching up and they were kind of barking at the gulls, the attention going on below them. And the cormorants below them were reaching up and ripping off their nest material. And here's another Brent's come around over here, but the uh, the algae that he has in his mouth isn't nearly as impressive. You can see the size of some of these nests, and they build them up year after year after year. Um, this pair of oyster catchers has chosen shells rather than pebbles. And here are two eggs. And uh, when you're watching them, you'll see one of them um, just sitting there and you wait for a shift change. Another one, the mate will be out foraging. And um, during a shift change, they'll get up and change position. And that's your opportunity to um, see the eggs and count them. So this is a Western gull. And um, this is a respectable size nest here. It's on this little shelf. And we came back two days later and they'd become quite ambitious with this nest. And unfortunately, that little shelf was not a stable place to hold all of that vegetation. So they started to lose it. And this guy here from the bottom, he's carrying up more vegetation thinking that's going to help. And it's starting to slide down. You can see the one egg there that's really precarious. And he's still piling more vegetation on top of it, thinking that's going to help. Now they've attracted the attention of a couple of others. Still working on it. And they finally have it stabilized here. This pair every year only had a single chick and uh, where the rest usually have two to three to four and um, we weren't sure why. They choose the same place year after year after year. And um, I think it was because of this one spot. It's a very small area, a little cup for the nest. And I think that's the reason why they generally only had one per year. There was only room for one. So besides overambitious nests, what other problems do they have? And there are also hungry ravens that are nesting in the same area. And um, you can see when mom arrives with food, um, there's three or four bright pink mouths waiting for them. And here's an oyster catcher that's chasing a raven. Very unusual sight because these oyster catchers have a high pitched voice. That's the only weapon they have. They have these funny little toes, um, this funny orange bill and uh, no talons but they're very defensive when they're breeding. 
here's baby ravens that have just fledged and they landed on this rock and they were about five feet away from each other and you can tell that they're very young they aren't shiny yet um they're kind of dull in color and they still have a little bit of color around their mouths and they certainly don't have the raven attitude yet and this is another problem that they have we were talking about the um peregrine falcons that are also nesting in this area this is a youngster and you can tell because of the vertical bars on the chest instead of horizontal that an adult would have. And I don't know if you can see it here, but these are serious talons on this youngster. And this is a peregrine falcon that's making off with a grebe, little grebe that was in uh, the Bodega Harbor. So raising a family, um, these gulls are so patient and so loving. These are two little spotted fuzzy chicks and they can be very, very demanding. And um, the parents are just wonderful. They are so patient and, and so calm and so relaxed around them. And there are some people that refer to them as rats with feathers. They don't like gulls at all, but um, when you see them and you watch your family life, you can't help but but really become attached to them. They're quite weird. And here's another pair. Um, there's still one egg in the nest here. And the two little chicks are looking out to see with the parents. And this is an oyster catcher. Um, when they hatch, they just lay prostrate and wet for about an hour or two hours. And you know you have a tendency to worry about them, but it's just that they're exhausted from the whole um, labor that's involved in breaking out of the eggshell. And, but once they're up and around, they are racing and they are picking up um, insects that are on the rock. And just like toddlers, just like kids, um, they wanna climb everything they see. So this guy has climbed up the, the loose granite here. And he's having trouble getting down. And so he's figuring out that he can stop himself from rolling with those stubby little wings and his stubby little bill. And he's caught the attention of mom over here. And he's made it back down to her side. Actually, this is dad. And I can tell because the pupil of the eye is perfectly round. Uh, with the female, there is... Um, usually a black blotch that extends out into the orange area of the eye. So this is actually dad. And he's, as soon as he's gotten back down safely, he runs right back up and now he's figured out that he can slide down sideways. These guys are like little wind up toys and they don't do very well. And um, you watch them, they're on a nest for 30 days or they're on an egg for 30 days and the eggs hatch and Every year I've been photographing them out there since um, well, before 2000, the year 2000. And every year it's like, I tell myself, do not become emotionally invested in them because you're going to lose them. And uh, you just can't help yourself. They are just so cute. And uh, what they do is they hunt, they forage, um, in the uh, muscle beds. And here, uh, mom or dad actually has brought back this huge piece of muscle meat. And I was concerned about how this pick was going to get it down, but he scarfed it right down very, very quickly. And as they get older, they start bringing back the entire muscle in the shell. And they are doing, they are instructing this chick here on how to break into the shell. And it's not an easy job. They have to, um, they use their mandibles, like pliers to try to work their way in. Um, sometimes they forage with a stabbing motion, um, which works well with limpets that are on rocks or barnacles. It takes them um, five years before they reach sexual maturity. And even at five, five years of age, they are they still may not have um, developed the skills to support a family yet. 
And you can tell, you can see all of the little muscle shells in the rock crevice here, that um, he's brought quite a few in. He's still showing him. And finally he's extracted the meat and giving it to him. So these are pelagic cormorants, and I was talking about how they breed on these vertical rock walls on these little shelves, and there's not much room. And um, here is a pair with, over on the right, there's a pair, and uh, the dull uh, birds here are the chicks. And you can see on the left, there's one that's, that's exercising his wings with very little room to do so. And I've, I've really fallen in love with the pelagic cormorants. They are very loving. They're very affectionate. There's no such thing as sibling rivalry here because there's absolutely no room for it on these little tiny ledges. So here are three. And um, you, you can see what a precarious area this is for raising a family. And they, at some point, they have to exercise. It's not their wings, but it's their uh, pectoral muscles. I'm getting another message that my internet connection is unstable. Are you still hearing me? Yeah, what? We, yep, we can hear you, but your, your video cut in and out a little bit. So if you want to turn your video off, that will probably help, especially it's raining hard here now, too. Oh, okay. So let's see if I can. Okay. Okay, so they actually take turns. So this is number one, he was exercising his pectoral muscles. And then he goes off on the side and lets number two exercise his pectoral muscles. And you can see that he's developing quite a wingspan here. And now it's number three's turn. This is really quite remarkable. And flight school for gulls is really, really fun. It, about mid-August, if you go out there on a windy day, you can tell they're jumping up and down and they're flapping their wings. But do they really work? So this is the pelagic cormorant family. And um, the entire family, both parents and two of the chicks were down below and calling to this guy who was really reluctant. He was very, very nervous about making the big jump and the leap of faith. When he did so, he landed on this ledge here and they were still calling to him. And finally he jumped and he hits the water. And this is a pelagic cormorant. They make their living in the sea. So seeing a sea, a, a sea born bird hit the water for the first time is really quite exciting. It's it's really a lovely sight to see. And here are the gulls in fly, flight school. Here's the adult. The adults are dark gray and white, and the youngsters are this brown color. And um, that's how you can tell them apart. And the adults fly overhead calling and encouraging them. And uh, they finally take off. Landing is another story. That takes a lot of skill and a lot of practice. So fledging is just the beginning. Only about 10% of juveniles survive their first year. Uh, the black oyster catcher fledging success, as I mentioned, is not very high. Um, it takes the black oyster catchers five years to reach sexual maturity, but they aren't yet sufficiently skilled at foraging to feed a family. And uh, Western gulls have to survive four years before reaching adulthood and all cormorant species reach sexual maturity in two years. So this is why um, monitoring their breeding success is really important because we're only seeing, you know, 10% of, of, of uh, those that hatch are going to make it just until their first year. Um, our cormorant, our common myrrh colony out at Gull Rock, um, last year there were over 8,000 of them. Right now, there are 5,200 of them as of last week. Uh, these are adults. So they're doing quite well right now, but it's an El Nino year, so we'll see what happens. And of course, disturbances are always a concern. 
So are there any questions? Okay, so I'm gonna try to bring up my other PowerPoint. Okay. Um, can you slide species identifications and codes? Yep. Okay. Okay, so there are um, four letter codes that we use, uh, abbreviations for these seabirds. And um, as you can see here, Western gull is two words and the code is W-E-G-U. It's the first two letters of each of the two words. Common myrrh is C-O-M-U. Pigeon guillemot, P-I-G-U. Common raven is C-O-R-A, and peregrine falcon, P-E-F-A. And we do have legends that have all of these codes on them, but these are what we use on our data sheets and um, generally in our reports. So surf bird, um, we see surf birds on the rocks. They don't necessarily breed there, but they do gather. And that is a one word name. So the abbreviation for that is the first four letters. It's just surf. And the pelagic cormorant, that's a P-E-C-O. Double crested cormorant is three words. So that is a D-C-C-O. And Brant's cormorants, that's an outlier, it's brack. And the reason why is because brown cowbird, for some reason, has the B-R-C-O. And as I said, these are on, um, we, we only have a very few species. These are on the data sheets. We have legends for you. And you'll be talking about Wigus and Kamus and Pigus and, and Peppas and Bracks before long. And um, the Canada goose that you saw, Kathy, that's a C-A-N-G because otherwise it can be confused with the cackling goose. So this is the Western gull. As I said, it's the only gull which breeds along our coast here. It has a darker mantle or uh, the dark gray um, wings here than the other gulls that you'll see hanging out here right now. And can anybody tell me what the four letter code for them is? Wegu, W-E-G-U. You got it. Okay, here's the common myrrh family. And um, as I said, they look like our little penguins and they are breeding um, out at Gull Rock, which is south of Jenner. They're also breeding on Bodega Rock, which is in the middle of Bodega Bay. And uh, we think they may be being right off of the west side of Bodega Head this year. We're gonna be watching for them. So what's their four letter code? Can somebody tell me? Kamu, Komu, Kamu. That's right. So this is easy. So the Pigeon Guillemot, they're the little playful guys. Anybody have an idea what the four letter code is? P I G U. And they're easily recognized by the bright red throats and bright red feet. And we don't see them, we don't see their nests, by the way. They burrow inside of the rock. So the rocks will have different little crevices that you see them coming and going. And here's the three cormorant species. And you can see they actually look quite different. The uh, pelagic cormorant is on the upper left here and it has that red, that red skin around the eye. And you can see um, it has this skinny little neck here and this, this very narrow head compared to the Brant's cormorant down on the bottom, who's a much chunkier animal. Um, and the Brant's has a turquoise eye and this bright, blue pouch here, which starts to fade pretty quickly once the eggs start start to hatch. 
And this is the double crested over on the right here. And his gular, his pouch, or I should say his and hers, because it's both male and female, is an orange. And the, the feathers from the back, they look kind of scalloped. Um, they're brown and black. So here's the Brant's cormorant again, and you can see he's got a chunkier body. He's a heavier bird. And can anybody tell me what the four letter code for a Brant's cormorant is? This is the outlier. It's a brack. Hey, Hollis, I have a quick question for you. Yep. So, is Gleason, so is Gleason the only site that has all three of the cormorants? That's right. Yeah. That's right. Okay. So they have different preferences in terms of terrain. And um, the very top of the rock, which may be somewhat level, is preferred by the Brant's cormorants. Um, the sides of the rock, which... Um, might lean down at a slight angle it is the favored territory of the double crested. And the sheer vertical rock face is the preferred territory of the pelagic. Now you can tell when they're breeding, you can tell by the, the color of the gular or the pouch. But once the colors start to fade a little bit, um, it's they do have strong preferences for the type of terrain where they're breeding. So you'll see that at Gleason. Um, the other sites have Brant's and double and uh, pelagic, but the pelagic are on those little tiny shelves on those vertical walls, and they're no double crested or, or, or on any of our other sites. So uh, once you get out there and you're with experienced people, um, you really don't have to worry about sorting them out. Um, you, you know, they have their they have their definite spots, their definite places where they breed, and as, as I said, you're with experienced uh, monitors, and uh, once you know where to look for them and where to expect them, they're not that difficult to tell apart. And here's the pelagics, and you can see they're on these little tiny these little tiny ledges here. Um, during early in the breeding season, they have these white patches on their flanks. Um, this pair is still on eggs over here. Up in the upper left, you see that the um, they have chicks and the white patches have faded. They're gone at this point. Can anybody tell me what the four letter code is? Pico. So who's going to tell me, who can tell me um, which comorant is on the upper left here? Pelagic. 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 What about on the right? Double crested. And what about on the bottom? Brands. Brands. You got it. <laughs> See, it's really not hard. we talked about the nest material before. If you see them on sticks, you know it's a double crested. Um, they will also use vegetation, but if they're on sticks, it's very definitely a double crested. If you're near freshwater, it's a double crested. Um, the other two are strictly marine species. And here's the black oyster catcher. Does anybody want to take a shot at what the four four letter code is? It's Bloy. And this this follows the standard. It's B L O Y. In the Canada goose, there's only one spot where they nest, and that's at Gleason. And this is the outlier. It's a C-A-N-G. And the raven, it's a C-O-R-A, Cora. 
This one, by the way, was a friend of mine for over 20 years. And the peregrine falcon, P-E-F-A. So anybody want to take a shot at the upper left bird here? Remember, that's the little penguin. Common myrrh. Common myrrh. But about on the right at the top. Black oyster catcher. And um, what's this gull down here? Western. Western gull. Western gull. And what about on the lower left here with the blue gular or the blue pouch? France cormorant. France cormorant. And this is this is a classic breeding courtship position, by the way. They're showing off that pouch. Um, what about the upper right? This one has the orange gular. Double the crested. Crest. Double crested. What about the, the pair below? On the right. White patches and the red feet. Pigeon guillemot. Okay. And on the left on the bottom with the white flanks, it's a cormorant. And it's on a little ledge. Pelagic cormorant. Okay. And upper left. Common raven. You got it. Okay. So um, what we do, we have a duffel bag in a uh, locker, which is down at the Salmon Creek Ranger Station. And um, there's a kestrel in there, which is a weather instrument. You don't have to use it for the wind and um, the temperature, but you can if you like. Uh, we have binoculars, a tripod, a spotting scope, a camera, uh, cleaning equipment. We have a clipboard that um, has some cheat sheets inside of it. Um, we have our data sheets. We have uh, section maps, and I'll be going over what those are. And the legend, which has those four letter codes and um, other abbreviations on them and pencils and clicker counters. So what you do is you sign up on the schedule and you see who else is on the schedule and then people coordinate who's going to pick up the equipment. Generally one person will pick up the equipment, then meet at um, the site, uh, do the shift and then somebody else or the same person may drop the equipment off. You can bring on um, your cell phone. Uh, you don't really need a flashlight, water snacks. Um, people like to have a field guide and some people like to keep a journal or a notebook with them. Who can name this bird? Grant's cormorant. There you go. Look at those turquoise eyes. Uh, we don't monitor during heavy rain, dense fog, because we can't see, or high wind. We're really concerned about your safety, so be careful on the bluffs. Um, Bodega Head can be quite slippery. Um, who can name this bird here? Pelagic Cormorant. There you go. We have a Google Drive. And um, I think I sent you the link to it before and I'll be sending it out again. And uh, on that drive, we have all kinds of resources. There are a lot of um, wonderful articles on, on uh, there, there are studies that have done. Um, common MERS are really interesting. They mate for life, but actually there's a wonderful paper on divorce and common MERS. Um, we have uh, the contact list. We have our data forms there. We have um, photographs. Um, about once every three or four weeks, I pick up all of the completed data forms, scan them, and send them up to the drive so that you can always look back on what's happened a few weeks before or um, actually what happened the year before. Our volunteer manual is up there and our schedule is up there. And um, so it's an editable document. And what you do is you just put in your name 
Um, who can name the cormorant that's on the upper left? Anybody want to try? Pelagic. Pelagic. What about the upper right? Double crested. Double crested and down below? Grants. Grants. See, you've got it. So when we're filling out our forms, um, there are some mechanical pencils that are in that clipboard. And uh, we, we like to use those because they maintain their sharpness. Um, please print instead of using cursive writing. Um, we do not erase. And the reason why is that um, if there is a major disturbance and we have to go to court, um, we do not want to have um, the, the data forms in question. Now, we haven't had to do this, but there was a uh, situation up in Wallala several years ago where the um, merchants up there liked to set off fireworks right over Wallala Island on the 4th of July. And of course, this was right in the, the middle of the breeding season. And so they had to document the impact of these disturbances. And um, when if you go to court, they there is a uh, there's a tendency to say that community science is bad science, and so um, we do not want to erase. If we uh, update our accounts, you want to strike out a previous entry, or if you make an error, please include lots and lots of notes. The numbers are important. I mean, we're collecting the numbers for a reason, but your notes really paint a picture of what's actually going on out there. An example is a few years ago um, when Rich was monitoring Bodega Rock, which is in the middle of Bodega Bay, and that's a Comorant, that's a Brant's Comorant's colony there. And it was strictly Brant's Comorant's, a few Western gulls and a whole lot of pinnipeds, a whole lot of California sea lions and five or six big stellar bulls out there, stellar sea lion bulls, which, which are huge. And he happened to notice a couple of common murs that were hanging out there and thought that was interesting. And he just made a note of it. The following year, we noticed more and they were actually prospecting. And three weeks ago, there were 520 common murs out on Bodega Rock and they're actually breeding out there now. And so that, that little happenstance note, which didn't mean seem to mean much at the time, was really quite significant a year or two later. But it also paints a picture of what else is going on around you, which is really just these are wonderful environments to be, you know, to spend a couple of hours in. And um, this tells you what else is going on, which, which can be quite meaningful. Um, if there are no common MERS, like if you're at Gleason, then you want to put a zero in your cell. You reserve the X's in cells that are not counted. This may be if, if a fog bank comes in and so you can't count. And so this distinguishes whether there were actually zero birds there, but you actually zero of that species, but you actually did a full count versus a partial count. And this is what our primary form looks like. Um, those who have been doing this for a few years will note that it's been simplified quite a bit this, this year. And so we have the four letter codes for the different species on the left, whether it's a chick or an unknown or an adult or nests. And there's room for notes here on the size. There are other species down here on the bottom and weather and date information up at the top. Lots of rooms for notes on the back sides. And Bodega Rock is the only rock where we also count pinnipeds. And so there are there's a large group of California sea lions out there which share the rock <laughs> with the cormorants and now with the common murs and a few gulls. It's a really interesting community. And we have been watching five or six big stellar sea lion bulls out there. Uh, we do not know if they are breeding, but most of them have been seen on the backside that, that's not visible to us when people have um, gone around that backside on by boat. 
And so there has been interest from um, pinniped scientists on whether or not they're going to start breeding there as they have up by Fort Ross. So Gull Rock is um, just south of Jenner and it is a common murder colony. Um, I used to scope the Brant's cormorants that were nesting here until 2012 when some common murs showed up and they arrive about a month earlier than the Brant's cormorants. They're much smaller than the, than the corms, but because they arrive earlier, they stake out their territory and they have now taken over the entire rock and, and pushed the Brant's out. Um, a few years ago, um, the, the MERS arrived and they were rafting around on the water below, but they weren't climbing the rock and they weren't starting to get down to business yet because there was a pair of peregrine falcons sitting on top of that rock. So what it did was it enabled the cormorants to get a foothold because they arrive a little bit later. And so there were a couple of hundred cormorant nests that year. But typically it's the MERS arrive early and they push them out. So what's happened now is that the common MERS, there were 8,000 of them last year, and they have moved over, they have spread over to Bodega Rock, as I said, and now they're, they're showing up off of the west side of Bodega Head. And so they're actually kind of playing, it's like musical rocks now, uh, right off of Bodega Head. It didn't, we didn't used to have that many Brant, that Brant's Comorants, but since they're pushed out elsewhere, they're having to breed there as well. Hey, Hollis? Yep. You go back to that last picture. Um, if we show up and the rock looks like that, are we counting all of them? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. There and there's and there's a lot of them. So can... <laughs> yeah, there were over eight thousand of them. And <laughs> and if they're kind of sneaky. If they turn their back, they get, <laughs> they're really hard to see because all you see is the yeah. As I said, you're with experienced people who've been yeah. doing this for a long time. <laughs> and what we've done is we have broken out. This is a sectional map of Gull Rock. We have broken it out into nine sections. So you count one section at a time. You don't have to count the whole rock. Because let me tell you, you get interrupted and you start over again and you go, oh, I don't know if I've done this section before. I don't know if I've done that section before. So it's much easier to just count one section at a time. Your eyes don't tire. You don't get confused about where you've been, what you've done. There was also another reason we did this. Remember I was talking before about how the Brant's cormorants prefer that top level section of rock. And when the common MERS first started showing up in 2012 and 2013, our program began in 2013. And the MERS, the MERS were arriving earlier. They also prefer those, those more level sections. So we were curious if they were going to be pushing the Comorants down into the less desirable areas on this rock, and they indeed were. So breaking this rock up into these various areas served two purposes for us. Now it's practically all common MERS, but it's much easier if you just count one section at a time. So what we do is we have a, um, oh, and then also here's Gull Rock. They also breed on two other rocks that are there that are nearby. So we have a, a supplemental sheet. And we this is where we put our initial counts. And um, you can see there's also, besides Gull Rock, there's also to the north, there is one sheer rock wall, it's one cliff that have the pelagic comorant nests as well. So our, our supplemental sheet is where we do our first count. And you can see over here on the left, it's broken up into all these different sections on Gull Rock. Then we have the subcolony one and subcolony O2 down below, which are those two adjacent rocks. And then the northern cliff on Peak Hill, which has the pelagic corms. So we do our first counts on this sheet and then transfer them all over to the primary data sheet.
And Bodega Rock sits out in the middle of Bodega Bay. And what we do is we park in the east parking lot of um, uh, Bodega Head and then walk down the trail. And you go down to the southern tip. And it is filled with Brant's cormorants, except that now the common murs have moved in there as well as the, the pinnipeds, the sea lions. And it's a much easier rock to count. We don't um, have a supplemental sheet for it because it's just a long, low rock. It doesn't have as many. Here you can see there are a few sea lions down here. And here on the east side of the rock is where most of the sea lions congregate. We were really curious when we first started doing this how the cormorants maintain their territory with these big animals. I mean, these sea lions are huge. And there are breakwaters down in the Monterey area where every April there's kind of a battle going on between the sea lions and the cormorants. But here, um, ours have held their ground. Now we're very, very curious because the little common murs, which are really tiny, they're quite small compared to these big, these big marine mammals. And uh, they're holding their own as well. So it's a very interesting rock. And as I said, this is the only rock, this is the only site where we count the pinnipeds as well as the, the breeding birds. And on the west side of Bodega Head, there are a lot of, um, there's a number of different rocks. And what we did was this part, this um, is part of the marine protected area. And Dan Robinette and a couple of other avian biologists did a um, count as the marine protected areas were being implemented. So they wanted to do a baseline count and we selected the rocks that we were going to count when we moved over to Bodega Head West, we selected the rocks we were gonna count to be consistent with what they counted when they were doing their baseline um, data collection just as the MPA was being implemented. So we do this big main rock here, which is when you're standing there with the whale watchers are standing it's that big rock that's right in front of you. And then we do surrounding rocks and also the cliff face over on the left-hand side. And this is a photograph of one of these rocks. It's filled with um, Brant's Comorants now. It used to be all Western Gulls. The Comorants had to be, had they, had, they had somewhere to go when they were being pushed out by the MERS. And these are the cliff faces um, that are heading south. And those are all pigeon guillemots. I was talking about the little crevices that they, they burrow in and they nest inside the rocks there and the pelagic. So we use a supplemental sheet for this, the west side of the Bodega head colony. So we have the main rock and then we have the back side. Um, we are now going up the hill a little bit so that we can get a better view of what's happening on the backside. And that's because that's where the common murders are. And we want to document whether or not they're, they're starting to nest there. By the way, there's a paper um, there. Well, there are a couple of papers on the common murders that are on the, the um, Google Drive. And the literature says that it's a very rare occurrence to observe the formation of a common mer colony. Well, Gull Rock, they first appeared on Gull Rock in 2012. We started doing our monitoring there in 2013. So we documented the formation of that common mer colony. A few years ago, they showed up down on Bodega Rock and we documented the formation of that colony and we may well be documenting the formation of a third colony right offshore here. And, um, where the literature says this is a very unusual opportunity. One thing we do off of Bodega Head West, and it's because we want to remain consistent with the baseline counts that we've done for the MPA, is we also count what's on the water, which we don't do elsewhere. Um, here, this is a sample data form, primary data form, and you can see the zeros. Um, every cell has to be filled in. 
And so we had no chicks. This was early in the season. We had no chicks, no unknowns, only adults at that time. Uh, the notes on the back here, um, there were 12 harbor seals that were seen at Rock Point, which is a rock off of Gleason. And that's it. So I've thrown a lot of information at you. I wanted to impress upon you that there aren't that many species to get to know. Um, the only thing that is at all confusing at first are the three species of cormorants, but you're, uh, you know, you're always with people that are familiar with the rocks there and with that territory. So that really isn't an issue. The four letter codes, we have um, legend for that. And you become familiar with those quite quickly. It's just a matter of um, of knowing, you know, what's breeding where. Now, I encourage you to try different sites. Um, we do Gull Rock on Friday mornings. We do um, Bodega Rock on Monday afternoons. We do Gleason on Saturday mornings. And the reason why is because we have some monitors that work Monday through Friday. And so, um, you know, we have one site that we can do on weekends to make that available for those people. And then we've been doing Bodega Head West on Thursday mornings. So if these days fit into your schedule, I encourage you to try out the different sites. They all feel different. Um, there's a different selection of birds. I really like Gleason and uh, Bodega Head West because um, as I said, Bonnie really likes the behavior observing the behavior and the interactions as, as, as do I. Um, so I like being a little bit closer in than you are if you are monitoring Bodega Rock or Gull Rock. Hey Hollis, can I, um, can I say something from perspective from like last year doing uh, multiple sites? Absolutely. So on Gold Rock, you get a lot of birds, but the the group that goes out there is really um, really knowledgeable, and you're not you're not left to your own devices. Everybody helps count. Two people two people will do the count, and then they 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 um, they ask each other at the end of the count. So it's not so you it's not a big heavy lift. Um, when you see all the birds, so to not get overwhelmed because Gold Rock has a pretty, pretty good group of people that are pretty steady that go out every week. There's usually um, three to five people um, for Gold Rock. And on Gleason, which has the, and those are the, I do Gold Rock and Gleason. And on Gleason, where you get the cormorants, it actually, Hollis is right. It becomes really easy to um, identify them. Um, because they, they, their behaviors and how they are out there is very, is very different and how they nest and where they nest, even though, um, they may, they, from the distance, they may look alike. It's not, it's not that daunting, even though there's the three species there. And the only two that I've ever seen really in, in my minimal time that, um, was overlapping a lot was the Brant and the pelagic species. Now, um, Kathy mentioned that the uh, Gull Rock crew comes out nearly every week. We ask for one shift a month. Um, we have four shifts per week. I mean, there's, there's four sites and it's one shift per site per week. But there are a lot of people that become um, intrigued with what's going on with the family life and what's going on, you know, on their site and on their rock. And, um, so there are a number of people that wind up coming out nearly every week. Mm -hmm. And we don't ask that of you. We just ask for one shift a month. But it becomes difficult to stay away sometimes. Especially if, now the Gold Rock crew, they're a third of a mile out. So they don't, and it's like 8,000 birds there last year. So they don't get to know those birds individually like you do if it's Bodega Head West, for example, or even Gleason. 
So they're just different environments. It's a different collection of characters out there and uh, uh, you know, a different kind of experience. So are there any other questions? There's one in the chat. Oh, uh, Gleason Beach is Saturday morning. So what I'll be doing is I'll be sending something out within a day or two. It'll have a link to the um, Google Drive. Um, you're welcome to shadow before making a commitment, but I'd like to know, you know if you're interested so that I can put you on the contact list and also add you to, um, we have a group email list as we do, some of you um, have been added to it for the seabird monitoring. And I mean, I'm sorry for the tide pool um, education group. And what most people do is at the following each shift, they um, send out a report to the entire seabird group on their counts for that rock and also any interesting observations that they've made. Um, so also the last shit report, we've already started monitoring the rock because the common MERS have arrived. And um, we won't be starting um, Bodega, I'm sorry, Bodega Head West or Gleason until April. Um, we will be going out um, to do a site visit on Bodega Head and hopefully we'll get both sites. We'll also have a hands-on um, session where buddy comes will get on experience with the equipment, with the camera, with setting up the scope. Um, it really makes a difference if you do it yourself rather than just observe. And let's see, so I'll send out the report from the Gull Rock Shift. Um, they couldn't go out on Friday because of rain. And links to the Google Drive. And I'll be asking if you want to be added to the contact list. You do not have to commit to anything. You can, you're welcome to shadow. Are there any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. Thanks, Hollis. Thanks, Hollis. Thanks, Alice. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Hope to see.